Well, with that, it, good morning. Good to see everybody out here today. Um, nice to see everybody. It's been a while. I want to thank everybody for the prayers that have gotten me through. I had a few health issues and we're on the mend and moving forward. Thank you for all your prayers. I greatly appreciate it. Um, would you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10? I was originally going to do a different message, and I came down here last Wednesday to get an estimate with the carpet cleaner, and we had a large encampment of homeless along our, our wall over here, larger than I remember being. It was probably six or seven people um, camped out with all their junk and all that, and it just got me to thinking a little bit. I'm going to start reading in verse 25, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and he stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, just ask your blessing on our message today, Father, may you hide your servant behind the cross, Lord. May they hear your words and your truth and nothing from me. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two levels of interpretation in, the, in this passage. We'll get to the, to the second one a little bit later. Um, parable answers, answers two questions. The lawyer asks, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life. First level of interpretation on this question, is it plain teaching? What is the object of the story? What is being said exactly? Any of you who know me know I am very conservative in everything, especially in God's word. I don't read into it things that are not there. I think that's very dangerous. I take that Warning in Revelation about he who adds to the Bible, those things will be added unto him, and I don't take anything away from it either. If God said it, I believe it, and that's the way I take it. However, there are some instances where we can read other things, but let's be careful reading too much into different things. Um, we have the lawyer and scribe, lawyer, same thing. Some of your versions may say scribe. These are teachers of the law. They know the Old Testament backwards, forwards, upside down. And it's not unusual for them to be out in public discussing things, showing off their knowledge, their wisdom, their intellect. Why? Probably because they're showing off. Really what they're doing, they're playing at religion. They're playing at church. They're showing themselves up to be more important than the subject matter. Is this story true? He doesn't say it's a parable. Um, he's telling it to some people who, if you believe the story about a Samaritan helping a Jew, they're going to say that's never going to happen. They were hated people. They were enemies. So I personally believe the story is true. Um, these people had a deep hatred for one another. So it's not logical that if it was true, people would have said, that's not true. We don't want to hear it. There's no use for us. And they would have turned and walked away. First question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
we need to understand this man's conditional mindset. He's, he's a Jew. He's a keeper of the law. He is a child of Abraham. So where does he think he gets his salvation? He's going to inherit his salvation from his predecessors, from Abraham, from his uncle, from his mom, from his dad. Salvation can never be inherited, people. You didn't get saved by your mom and dad being saved. You got saved by having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ yourself. It's not something you can inherit. This lawyer proved to be self-righteous. He was, next, as I said, an expert in the law. He's educated. Probably had a whole bunch of letters behind his name. You know, like those people going for their PhD now. I'm sorry, I couldn't use this. He's a type of person who's impressed with himself, likes to hear himself talk, likes to start small, subtle arguments. But he calls them discussions or debates. But that's not what they are. They're actual arguments to try to start something, create some conflict. And be honest, it's pretty common in intellectual or politically liberal circles. Excuse me for that. He thinks of himself as above others. He's smarter than they are. He's smarter than we are. They're smarter than we are. They know what's best for us. Head knowledge without a repentant heart is very dangerous. You know, there's many people that know and teach scriptures that have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they're dangerous. They're teaching something far false. We've all had Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons knocking on our door. Those are professional salesmen. And they're trying to sell you a bill of goods. How do you defend against them? You know the Bible better than they do. Salvation is not inherited. It is never earned. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are incapable of ever doing anything good enough for God. I'm going to go to Romans chapter 3. Start reading in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for good. For God, excuse me. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Law only shows guilt. If for some reason you're driving on a road somewhere and there's no speed limit, who's going to give you a ticket? There is no law on that particular road. The law shows guilt. The law shows your need for a savior. We are incapable of ever doing anything good enough to earn salvation. Cannot happen. And the Lord's answer to him, what is written in the law? The lawyer answers right. He knows the law. He knows the law backwards and forwards. He's an expert in it. He knows the law. But it proves that the lawyer had failed. Is there anybody, anybody you know, besides the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever fulfilled those commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Any of you done that perfectly from the day you were born? Of course not. The lawyer knew the law, but he didn't apply it to himself. Only Jesus could fulfill these commandments. How should the lawyer have responded? 
I'm not able. I need help. What's the one thing you have to come to the realization of before you can be saved? You must realize you are L-O-S-T, lost. You cannot help yourself. You need to know your condition. This lawyer did not know his condition. Instead, he tries to justify himself. He tries to shift the focus to someone else. He asks, and who is my neighbor? Back up just a minute. Is the Lord teaching when he says, um, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live? Is the Lord teaching salvation by law keeping? No, he's not. He's just letting them know that you failed and you can't do it and you need help. But the lawyer doesn't get it. Why? He doesn't want to get it for one. He tries to shift the focus onto someone. And who is my neighbor? Do we often do this ourselves? Do we often, when we're picked out or something or guilty of something, do we try to push it off on someone else? What does Adam do in the garden when he sins? The woman that you gave me. He tries to place the blame on the woman and on God. Don't we do the same thing when we sin? We're far easier on ourselves when we sin than we are on our neighbors, aren't we? Or on others. We're far easier. We can justify what we do real, real quickly. But if somebody else did the exact same thing, not, not, not even close. But why did the lawyer feel the need to justify himself? Nobody accused. The Lord didn't accuse him of anything. Why did he feel the need to justify himself? It's called pride. You think by now in this conversation, the lawyer's thinking, you know, maybe I probably shouldn't have asked him this question. Because he's kind of getting the tables turned on him a little bit. The lawyer was trusting in his heritage, his knowledge, his position as a scribe or a keeper of the law. He's relying on that. He's relying on tradition. Some people do that today. There are preachers and pastors and teachers and priests and other things that are counting on what they've done, who they are to save them. But that's not the truth. You've got to wonder deep down in, in this lawyer's head, do you think he knew the truth? If you're an expert in the law, do you think he knew the truth? I think somewhere way back in the back of his mind, he knew it, but his pride wouldn't let him accept it. Bible doesn't tell us, so I, I don't know. What does the Bible tell us about neighbors? Romans chapter 13. If you're wondering why I give you a lot of scriptures, it's because you need to hear the Bible. You don't need to hear what I have to say. Romans 13, uh, starting in verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Is there anybody here who has never done their neighbor a wrong? And I don't mean the guy that lives next door to you. That's not who your neighbor is. We'll get into that a little later. Is there anybody here who's never done anybody any wrong ever? Of course not. Notice Jesus does not answer the question directly. He gives them another question. <coughs> Excuse me. He tells a story. Excuse me, he doesn't ask a question. He tells a story. He relates an incident of which he knew. Of course, the Lord knew everything. And I'm sure there's some people in that audience that probably knew of this particular story. It would be big news if a Samaritan person were to help out a Jew. That would be big news. Those people hate each other. That would be like a gang member in Chicago helping a police officer or something. It just didn't happen. Um. Going through a couple of different commentaries, I found out the road from Jerusalem to Jericho winds down a mountain for about 17 miles, and it descends in height about 3,300 feet. It's very desolate, very lonely, plenty of hiding places for ambushes. I personally didn't believe that when I first read it till I moved here. 
till my first trip up north. Uh, growing up, I used to watch John Wayne and the Indians and the Cowboys. And I always saw the Indians before the Cowboys did. How come John Wayne didn't see it first? Well, up in the mountains, yeah, there's a lot of places you can hide and ambush. This was a very dangerous stretch of territory. Plenty of places for robbers to hide. And it was known for that. But that was the one road. I don't think they had police officers back in that day. I don't think you really want to travel alone down a dark street in any of our major cities right now either. But there were four men. Four tra the traveler, probably Jewish, doesn't tell us for sure, but probably Jewish. That's who used that particular road. The priest and the Levite, they knew, of course, knew all about the laws. And then there was a Samaritan. They were on their way down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Not on the way up, they were leaving Jerusalem, the place of worship, evidently to go home. Uh, the priest, he was, finished his duties, whether he was the priest of the year, holy of holies for a month or just a week of service, whatever. We don't know that, but he had just come from serving the Lord. You would think the Lord would be fresh in his mind, but he wasn't. He was anxious to get home. Maybe. He didn't want to take the time. He didn't want to touch a dead guy because he might be defiled. Maybe it's the Sabbath is coming up. I don't know that. It doesn't tell us that. Didn't want to be defiled. But he also didn't go to look to see if the man was dead, did he? Could have been a trap. Fearing for his own life. Um, the robbers could have sent a guy out there just to draw you in so that they take your mind off and then they could surround you and get you because you're distracted on something else. Is it possible? Yeah. And as we go through things, we need to use common sense. We don't go charging into certain areas or certain things without common sense because there is danger out there. But this was a man who had just come. Excuse me, must be some of my meds. He's got my mouth very dry. Forgive me for that. Um, he's not on his way to the temple, as we said. He's on his way home. But he doesn't want to get involved. Let somebody else do it. We have a Levite. The Levites assisted the priests in their duties in the temple. They preserved the law. Um, some of your versions say that the man came over for a closer look. Let me, let me see if he's dead. Let me see if he's alive. Oh, maybe let me see if there's any money left. Maybe they left it all, didn't, didn't take it all. We don't know what the reason he went over there for. Both of these men would have been expected to help. You have a, probably a Jewish traveler who's been beat up, wounded, whatever. You have a priest, a man of God, and a preserver of the law who knows we are to love your neighbor as yourself. But yet, what do they do? They walk right by. They don't help. Any old excuse to not help someone in need is pretty prevalent today, isn't it? Everybody is too busy. Oh, I meant to call you, but I'm too busy. I meant to check in on you when you were sick, but I'm just too busy. I'd rather have you say, I really didn't think about you because, you know, I don't care, rather than lie to me and tell me you were thinking about it and you just didn't have time. Because anybody that doesn't have two minutes of time in a day, you're doing something wrong. You're definitely not planning your time right. Doctors at accident scenes drive right by. Why? Insurance reasons. And everybody's so happy, so I can understand that. I mean, I know growing up, in Chicago, oftentimes you would see a police car drive by, see a crime. They would continue to drive by. They didn't want to get involved or they were being paid by the people doing that. It happens. Some people just don't care. They don't want to be involved. These men knew the law to the utmost. They knew every inch, every speck of the law. Yet they didn't help. They lacked mercy. They lacked compassion. And the point of that is both men were without excuse. They were only interested in the rules of religion, not the application of religion. It's one thing to know of the Savior. It's another thing to know the Savior. It's one thing to know about a person. It's another thing to know the person. What good would it have been for that man that was laying half dead on the road? What good would it have been for him to recite the Ten Commandments or the laws? It would have done him no good. So what good was the law? The law needed to be put into action. 
reciting the commandments, doing anything like that with the law. It had nothing to do. It could not possibly help him. Next, we come to the Samaritan. First off, it's unusual for Samaritan to be on that road. He's in foreign territory. He's not only risking the thieves, he's risking fellow travelers. He's risking people who hate him. Remember, the Samaritans were a hated mixed blood race. The Jews wanted nothing to do with them. Had he been in trouble, no one would have helped him. I mean, there are, there are roads and stuff in America now that, that police or firemen don't even, ambulances don't go to until the police have gotten there and taken care of the area. They just don't go in there. Can you imagine laying on the ground, beaten half to death, and the ambulance takes an hour because the police have to come first to secure the area? That's how dangerous this area was, but yet the Samaritan was there. He sees the man. He has compassion on the man. Some versions may say pity, but I don't believe it's pity. I believe it's compassion. It's love. It shows a deep feeling of sympathy. What a difference from the other two's attitude. What a difference from the normal relationship between a Jew and a Samaritan. His sympathy moves him to action. He takes his religion and does something with it. He applies it. He bandages his wounds. Probably tore his own clothes to make the bandages. Pours oil and wine. One is a disinfectant, one to soothe. Both of them from his personal belongings. He took from his to give to someone else in need. Put him on his own donkey. By doing so, that means he had to walk. He took him to the inn. He cared for him. And when he had to go, before the man was healed, he gave the innkeeper two days wages, two denarii, and also promised future payment. The Samaritan didn't give a single thought to not helping. Didn't say he stood there twiddling his thumbs, deciding, should I do this or not? He did it. He saw a need, and he jumped to it. He put another person's needs above his own conveniences. What if he had to be somewhere at a certain time? He was traveling down that road for a reason. But he took his own time to go do something. When the Lord brings someone in your life, if you're having a busy day, and someone calls you, someone this, the Lord's bringing them into your life for a reason. Take the time to talk to them. You're not too busy. What a shock it must have been to the lawyer, to the audience, as the Lord told this story. To the lawyer, the wounded man was Jewish. The priest and the Levite were Jewish. To him, they were the good men, maybe his neighbors, maybe his friends, but they were his equals. And here we have the despised Samaritan, the hated enemy, is the one who, for lack of a better word, is the hero of the story. When the Lord asks him which one proved to be a neighbor, how did he respond? Oh, the one who showed mercy. Couldn't bring himself to say that person that I hate so much, that Samaritan did. Couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan. Had to say the one who showed mercy. Couldn't even, couldn't even bring himself to say the word. The answer almost had to be dragged out of him. He just flat out willfully did not want to accept it. Remember the, in the first verse, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. This lawyer was not asking this so he could learn something. He was trying to trick the Lord. He was trying to trick the Lord into maybe circumventing the law or saying, you know, we don't have to obey that part of the law. This lawyer was not being honest. What does Jesus say? He says, go and do the same. Go and do likewise. He reverses his question on him. 
the lawyer thought it was up to others to prove themselves worthy of being his neighbor. Not the other way around. He wasn't going to be the neighbor. They had to prove themselves worthy to be his neighbor. It would be like me saying, you have to prove yourself worthy to be my friend before I'll be your friend. You must give to me before I will give to you. Entirely wrong attitude. But that's the attitude this man has. Jesus forces him to ask himself, are you a neighbor? Am I a neighbor? Ask yourselves this. Are you a neighbor? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus makes it very clear. We have a responsibility to be a neighbor. Doesn't tell us what the lawyer did afterwards. Doesn't tell us if he went home and thought about it for a while and came back. We never know. We won't know till we get to heaven. And I'm afraid that's with a lot of people that we may witness to. You may plant the seed. Ten years from now, somebody else waters. And you won't know that that seed you planted until you get to heaven. You won't know. So never take it and miss an opportunity to share God's words. You will never, ever know. The scribes and the Pharisees, the priests, lawyers, they hated sinners, tax collectors, Gentiles, prostitutes, lumped them all together. They hated them. But we're told to love the sinner, but hate the sin. That's putting the law into practical application, not just be following a rigid. Luke 6.27 says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. The lawyer's lack of love toward others shows he didn't realize how much he needed the love of God himself. Luke 7.47 Many of you can attest to this one. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Do you really understand what the Lord Jesus Christ and God has forgiven you for? Do you realize the price that was paid for you? What you do is not what makes you a sinner. You do those things because you're a sinner. You were born a sinner. You were born lost, destined for hell. You've been forgiven far more than we'll ever, well, maybe in heaven we'll know what we've been forgiven. I don't think we grasp the vastness of it right now. I really don't think we do. I know the blackness of my own heart. And I get to see it more and more as I grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I see myself more and more as I am. And I don't like myself. I don't like who I am inside, the old, unregenerate person. But aren't you glad we're a new creation? Aren't you glad you've been regenerated? That's not who you are. Your old sinful nature is nailed to the cross. Yes, it still rears its ugly head up and bites you, and you won't be done with that till you're in heaven. But you have a new spirit of God living within. Aren't you glad for that? Can you imagine what it would be like to just live a, many of us can, live a life of sin and not know the truth? That's how, that should just encourage us to get out and witness more and more and more and meet these people, help these people, show them God's love. The attitudes of the men in the story toward the wounded man. To the lawyer, he was somebody to discuss or debate. To the thieves, he was someone to use and take advantage of. To the priest and the Levite, he was the problem to ignore, the problem to avoid. To the innkeeper, he was a tool for making money. Innkeeper didn't offer a free room or offer to take care of him for free, give him free food, wine, no, didn't offer him that. It was a tool to make money. A Samaritan saw him as a person worth being cared for and loved. From this story, we get three points to learn about loving our neighbor. Not loving is easy to justify. I'm too busy. I don't like that person. That person's not worth it. Let somebody else do it. But it's never right, is it?
who is our neighbor. Our neighbor is anyone in need, regardless of race, political view, or status in life. Too often we give the best seats to those that are prominent, well-read, well-off. And if a street person walks in, hasn't showered in three months, he sits down next to you, what are you going to say? Are you going to show him God's love? Or are you going to tell him you need to sit in the back? Many churches would make him sit in the back. I don't believe anyone here would. Love requires action to meet needs. First John 3.18. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue but in deed and in truth. Don't love me with your talk. Love me with your walk. Show me your love. You can go out here and talk to these people, the homeless people or whoever you run into all day long. But until you actually help them, till you provide something of yourself, be it time, be it water, be it whatever you give them, a sandwich from McDonald's, until you do that, you're wasting your breath. They have to see it in action. They've been told those words a million times. They have to see it in action. But that brings us to what I brought this message for. What do we do about somebody panhandling, begging? Somebody's holding up a sign at the intersection. Um, my uncle Charlie Ross was um, one of the heads of the Pacific Garden Mission when it was the old lighthouse down on State Street. I worked right across the street under the Wabash L train. And I went over and had lunch with him a few times and that really made me not want to be homeless. Let me tell you, that place was not real nice. Um, but there were homeless people all around, far worse than here. This was back when Skid Row was in Chicago, all that, the wine out. I can't tell you the number of people as I would be walking to work, lunch in my hand, brown paper bag. Hey, can you spare some money for some food? I'm hungry. And I would offer them a sandwich. What was their response? Every single time. Not once did someone take that sandwich. I don't want that stuff. I want some money. But what are they going to use the money for? Alcohol and drugs. Do I want to enable someone to do that? Is it okay? I believe God and the Holy Spirit will guide you to those that you should help. And I didn't stop offering sandwiches after that period of time. I kept offering it, but I wasn't going to give them any money. Number one, I didn't have any money at that time as a young man. Um, but is it okay to, no, I don't want to enable them? Or will God judge our motives? Will God judge our heart? Are we giving it to that person to get them out of our face, to clear them away from the chapel? Or are we giving it to them because we love them and we want to show them we love them? God expects us to use common sense. He gave it to us. He expects us to use it. But what does Jesus say? Go and do the same. Do the same as what? Do the same as the Samaritan. Go and do likewise. Uh, I told you earlier there were two interpretations. We'll get to the second one now. Um, I'm going to read this to you because I had to look it up because I don't remember from high school English class what an allegory is. An allegory is the expression through symbolism of truths or generalizations, generalizations about human experiences. We must ask ourselves, what did the Lord tell this parable for? What's the message? How does he want us to interpret it? Not, can we make it say what we want it to say? It's very easy to take the Bible, take a verse out of context and twist it to say anything you want. I heard a preacher on TV telling me that Adam was the first Superman. His reasoning, 
Well, Adam was told to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. So Adam was able to fly and have dominion over the birds and fish and swim in the fish. This is a pastor on TV telling us. You think that's a little out of context? That's why I said, be careful how you twist a verse. Be careful to read too much into it. It's very easy to read something into this one, though. The wounded man. He's a sinner, fallen man who can do nothing for himself. He had to be helped by someone else. There's no way to go but down. The robbers were sin and Satan beating a man down. Think about you before you were saved. What condition were you in? Were you any better off than that man who was half dead? No, you were fully dead in your sins, weren't you? The priest and the Levites, a picture of organized religion. The law with all of its ceremonial rites, with all of its rules and regulations, traditions. It's powerless to save the dead. The law commanded love your neighbor, but didn't give you the power to do it. If the law gave them the power, then Christ died for nothing, didn't he? The law was set to do one thing only, to show us our guilt and our shame. We have the Samaritan who was the Lord Jesus Christ who came down to where we had fallen, saved us from our sins and made full provision for us throughout eternity on earth and in heaven. Jesus is the ultimate neighbor whose compassion was the total opposite of the Jewish leaders of that day. Jesus was the despised Samaritan. The world hated him. There's a reason the world hates us. Because they hated him first. The law says do. The gospel says done. If there's anyone here counting on earning their way to heaven, you can't do it. If you're doubting that you're good enough, don't doubt because you're not. None of us are. Never will be. Jesus paid our price of admission. Trust him the only way. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the ultimate good Samaritan father. But Father, he calls upon us to be that good Samaritan out in his world. And his world is wicked and cruel and evil. And there are many that are looking to trip us up, Father, but there are so many that are sick and need and hurting out there. Give us the wisdom, the discernment to know what to do, what to say, how to say it, how to help. But, Father, instill in us a spirit of courage not to be afraid of these people, Lord. Not to be, oh, I don't want to get near them. I might catch something. They might hurt me. Father, give us the courage to share the good news, the gospel, with these that are lost. Father, make us sacrifice that which we have to help others. May we truly see it as you do. <laughs> Father, protect us as we go out now into the world, and may we truly make a difference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.